Live is where we're going. Yes, we're going live. Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast, everyone. Thank you for sharing your Sunday evening with us, or in David Conyers case, Monday morning. Uh, or if you're listening or watching later, um, welcome. Uh, our guests today, guests, plural, uh, are Callie White and David Conyers. Hey, guys. Uh-huh. So we're going to talk to Callie first. Um, the interesting thing is we're, we're going to be talking about two very different types of horror, really. Um, Kelly wrote a book called The Monsters We Make. And, you know, it's, it's the horror that human beings can do to each other. Uh, and it's based off of, it's, it's a fictional, it, it's fiction. It's a novel, very well-written novel. And, uh, but it's, it's based heavily on Johnny Gosh, the missing paper boys in the early to mid eighties in Des Moines, Iowa, where I'm, I'm from. So, uh, when I saw it on the shelf at Barnes and Noble, I had to nab it. So actually what I did was I didn't nab it. I went home and nabbed the Kindle because I like to highlight. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, we're going to do introductions and then, then get back to you if that's all right. Yep. Um, you, you, the other kind of horror we're, we're going to talk about is Lovecraftian horror with David Conyers. So this is the Chaosium limited edition not too yeah. many of these out there. <laughs> yeah, but if, if people are listening, what are you what are you talking about? Man? It's a copy of the spiraling worm that was put up by Chaosium, which has quite a few of David Conyers' best stories in it. Really? It's from 2007. We should have yeah, him on the show. We should invite him on the show. <laughs> uh, Matt, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, hi, I'm Matt. I, uh, I'm Matt Carpenter. I uh, help for an easy movie night, and I got a prize today. It is the Flesk publication hardcover edition of The Call of Cthulhu. And what makes it good is it has all these wonderful drawings and illustrations uh, by Gary Gianni. So if you want to win this book, and of course you do, send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put COC in the subject heading. We usually draw a winner in about six weeks. Could be you. Uh, Rick, you want to introduce yourself? And before you do, I want to say that I, I've been thinking of you a lot lately and worrying about you. I'm really glad to see you today. So, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Uh, I'm Rick Lay, a writer and pulp magazine collector. Bridget. Hello, I am Bridget, a horror fan, write music and create art. When Bridget arrived, there was a little bit more class added to the podcast. So that's it's that's good. Glad I have uh, you fooled. <laughs> oh, you, do you? Okay. Um yeah, Bridget does a lot of things. She um does art. Um you do well, what do you call the physical objects that you do? Macabre. Um yeah, three D three dimensional art. Yeah. Yeah. And she's a composer and a musician. So uh Ben, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Ben Handelman. And uh just to be clear, Mike described two types of four, but there's actually three, and that's that the Patreons only send Mike free stuff and not the rest of us. And I just feel hurt and betrayed. And this is a special kind of horror. I'm just gonna sit over here and cry while the interview happens. Oh, so. you got me right here, Ben. Right here, right here in the heart. Uh, of course, you have a job, and I don't. If this is my job, you're doing your job right now. I am here out of the goodness and kindness of my heart because I love you, Mike. And yet, no one's sending me free stuff. And I just, yeah, you know, I don't invite betrayal. everybody here. It's really you that should be honored to be here, don't you think? All right, Ben, you know what? Send me your address. I'll send you a box of books. Is that a threat? Yes. He'll do it. it. He does it to me. (laughs) Yeah, he makes me pay for stuff. Hold on. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, no. Bridget, you don't understand. I'm not going to send him good books. Oh, okay. Fair. (laughs) Yeah, a bunch of romance from the 50s. I have a whole box of Danielle Steele novels. There you go. 
considering uh isn't it almost hallmark time for you pete well, you wait, should explain hey, that no. while you introduce yourself wait pete, uh, pete don't you have taken by the t-rex i wanted I to copy do. that i had taken uh, by the t-rex Right now, uh, Kelly's wondering what the hell she got into and hope wondering how soon she can get out of it. <laughs> Pete, introduce yourself, please. I'm Pete Rollick. I watch a lot of bad movies so that other people don't have to. And I write short stories and novels and I review books for some people. Mm -hmm. um, and I send them out to editors. I don't know if they ever bother to post them. I'm going to. Uh-huh. Sure. And This, uh, this week. Uh-huh. Sure. This week. I, I, in my defense, I've been a little busy. Um, David Conyers is here. I, I think that most people who read Lovecraftian fiction know who David Conyers is. And uh, David, we're going to come to you after we talk to Kelly um, oh. and uh, and uh, talk about your work. So oh. Cthulhu Unloaded and that series and so forth. So... Um, so Callie White is here. Callie is the author of a book called The Monsters We Make, which came out last year. Is that correct? Uh, 2020. Yep. 2020. Um, and coincidentally, right now, you can get it for $1.99 on Kindle. Mm -hmm. So this is good timing. So um, that, that's a really good deal for a really good book. Um, and I you want to introduce yourself, Callie, and then I'll I'll, I'll go on. Sure. Uh, well, first, thanks, Mike, and everyone for inviting me on. Um, I my name is Callie White. Um, uh, well, my full name is Callie White Vinbali. I write, uh, publish the monsters we make under my maiden name, Callie White. Um, but I have also written a couple other books, and those were published under my married name, Callie Vinbali. Um, so I've been writing and publishing for almost 20 years now. And the monsters we make was um, sort of a genre change uh, where I moved more into the crime fiction um, sort of suspense genre and I changed publishers. So uh, thus I started publishing a, under a new name that was easier to spell, easier to remember. Um, nothing, nothing wrong with my husband or his name, but um, <laughs> just it's just how it goes in the industry sometimes so um that's why the i have published under a couple different names now um so i also am a writer of um, short stories essays i've done some crime writing for the a e network um for for their blog their crime blog um oh, wow, they have that's on their cool. website yeah called that's real really crime cool. and then um i'm also a creative writing professor so that's the gist of it <laughs> Um, yeah, I think one of your students might be watching right now. He, yes. He tweeted earlier today. He so. did. He did. Some of them, you know, once they get, get through the MFA program, we keep in touch on social media. So that's great. Yeah. Uh, well, the monsters we make, um, you know, you can't tell a book by its cover, but it certainly can grab your attention. A good cover can, and get you to the next step of picking it up and seeing what it's about and I looked at that and I was like that's like small town mid-sized town fall uh autumn you know which I miss because I'm in Texas at the moment and I'm from Iowa where the book is set and where you live and uh actually anybody who's watching I've got part of it in the background there mm -hmm. so you can see what I'm talking about so I I just wanted to say that I love the book cover Thank you. Um, well, I'm not thank you. I had nothing to do with it. I say thank you, but I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> um, why did you want to write this book and what is this book about? Well, so the gist of the story is um, it's, as you said at the, at the top, that it's loosely based on a real um, unsolved case here in the Des Moines area, the, the Des Moines Paperboy abductions. Um, of Johnny Gosh in 1982 and Eugene Martin in 1984. And then there was a lesser known case, a third case in um, 86 of a young boy named Mark Warren Allen. Um, and these cases, so I'm, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, I'm in my forties. So these cases took place um, really right in the middle of my childhood. So I was seven when Johnny Gosh went missing. I lived in Iowa my whole life. 
um, at the time Johnny went missing, I was, um, I lived on a farm with my parents, um, some two hours away from Des Moines. So I had heard of the case. It wasn't, um, I wasn't completely aware of it, but in 1984, when Eugene Martin went missing, I happened to be in Des Moines with my family on a very rare family vacation to the capital city. And we happened to be staying on the South side of Des Moines, um, just a few blocks away from where Eugene went missing. And he went missing on my sister's, my older sister's 14th birthday. And so as a very sheltered farm kid, um, who had spent very little time in cities by that point in my life, um, that was a big deal um, to be so close to such a, a major crime. And I have this distinct memory of standing out in the parking lot of our hotel at the time and looking at the downtown Des Moines skyline and thinking to myself that someone out there was stealing children. And the idea had never occurred or crossed my child mind until that moment because of that case. Um, and anyone who did grow up in Iowa knows how um, sort of watershed those cases were. And they really shaped an entire generation of not only kids like myself who grew up with the cases, um, but also how we became parents, um, these very paranoid, vigilant parents. And it, it all traces back to those two cases in our state, they are major historical cases in our state. So I think I've always kind of had them in the back of my mind. Um, and then finally uh, started kind of, a story started brewing, a fictionalized version started brewing. Yeah. Mike, you're muted. Yes, I'm sorry. I'd like to read a quote from the book. Um, I met a monster once face to face. He did not have green skin or sharp teeth or long, scary claws. He was just a man who looked, who everyone thought it was a good guy because he was nice and looked like them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to think that underneath that is something monstrous is scary. The guy that you pass on the street. Mm -hmm. Um when Johnny Gosh went missing, I was a little older than you. I think he was 12, if I remember right. He was, yes. Yeah, and I was 11. So it was pretty much mm -hmm. right at that same age. And I lived in, um, on 69th Street in old Urbandale, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty close to West Des Moines. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was probably about a mile and a half away. Um, and it really hit me. And I never said anything to my parents. Uh, but I just thought, you know, that could have been me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I skateboarded down the street all the time. Um, that sort of thing. And it, it seems so strange now. But back then, we got the Des Moines Register and Tribune. We got yeah. a paper in the morning and we got a paper at night. Mm -hmm. And it was just nothing but Johnny Gosh for for quite a while yeah if memory serves yes and i'm sure that you and i are not alone in this that it hit a lot of kids the same way yes i i it really did i think it it affected an entire generation of iowa kids midwestern kids um you know there were a few other cases around that same time it was sort of the beginning of the era of the of missing kids that went national news. Um, you know, it started with that Etan Pates case in New York City, and then there were the Des Moines Paper Boys. There were um, there was a boy in Minnesota, um, and it was a it was a weird era too of that they that it was all over the news and it was everywhere. Um, these stranger abductions, um, which was something else in the in the book that I kind of explored that even though all these stranger abductions were all over the news and we grew up with them, in reality, the stranger abductions were just a very, very small percentage of kids who are, who go missing or are abused um, because at its core, the monsters we make really um, is, is, a, is an exploration of hidden abuse um, in private 
situations in families and neighborhoods. Um, yeah, so I don't want to give away any yeah. of the plot points, but you do drive that home that it's not just stranger danger, it's mm -hmm. the trusted uncle or family friend mm -hmm. or the yeah. nice guy that, that helps a lot, who's very well groomed and, yes. you know, um, everybody likes him. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that yeah. passage you read a little bit ago, that's from towards the end of the book when yeah. one of the main characters, she's this 18 year old um, senior in high school, and she's desperately trying to get this journalism scholarship so she can afford to go to school. She's lives with her single mother who's really struggling to raise um, her and her brother. Um, and it's part of this essay she writes um, after she has decided that the fictionalized version of the paper boy abductions in her neighborhood is what she wants to write about. And as she delves into it, at first she's attracted to that sensationalistic part of the stories that it's big news and everyone's talking about it. But as she gets into it, she starts to ingratiate herself somewhat dangerously into the real case, not realizing or having any idea just actually how close to home that same type of danger is in, in her neighborhood and in her own family. Um, and so that mm -hmm. piece at the end is part of the final essay she writes to submit yep. in how she realizes how she's come to realize at a young age that, um, you know, at first she had also been operating under the assumption that whoever kidnapped these boys was monstrous, was Often, you know, you hear people on the news refer to him as um, what kind of what kind of monster does this? What kind of, you know, it must be like Satan or the devil or something. But, you know, in some ways, I I felt I feel like that a little bit allows perpetrators to hide in plain sight because they don't look monstrous. They're just everyday people. And often they're really nice people in their day-to-day -day life you know they're a nice neighbor or you know yeah. your local electrician or whatever you know whatever it is they do i'm not um, religious but you know a passage of the bible talks about even satan is a shining <laughs> uh angel of light lucifer means morning star oh yeah. So, yeah so yeah um you, you mentioned new york and you mentioned that this is about the time that all this Mm -hmm. more or less started but you know the difference between new york city and where you and i live the area that you and i lived was this kind of th stuff just didn't happen right and you quote right away is this a real i think this is a real des moines register quote at the beginning is that right it is okay i thought it so is. yeah uh the quote is right at the beginning of the book and this really i think puts it into perspective uh and i'm and i'm so glad you included this so now the national media the television networks and the national press are fascinated with an unlikely tale. Terror in Des Moines of all places. We are on display. Each one of us bit players in a drama that examines what's wrong in a place that's supposed to be so right. Yeah, that was James P. Gannon. He was the yeah. publisher of the Des Moines Register at the time. Yeah, and he, he penned that um, uh it was like a guest column essay. I think it ran the day after Eugene Martin went missing. So in 1984, he wrote it in response. And so this was the second paper boy of his newspaper who had gone missing in a matter of two years. Um, and, you know, I, the majority of the book is built around the fictional Eugene Martin case, which is the, the 1984 case, the second case that takes place. Um, for a couple reasons. One, the Johnny Gosh case, the one that started it all, um, you know, here in Iowa, especially in Des Moines, people were a little reluctant to admit or even entertain the idea that a 12-year-old boy had been kidnapped off a street corner while doing something as innocent as delivering newspapers. And so for two years, there was just a, a, a pretty heavy shadow of doubt that Johnny was abducted, that he could have run away. There was even for a long time, a lot of suspicion around his parents, that his parents had killed him and hidden his body. Imagine but, that losing your, 
your yes. son and then being accused of, of it or yeah, looked at in that light. Did. Right. Yeah. But once the second case happened, the Eugene Martin case on the South side, there was no denying it anymore. Um, yeah. that, that there was a, a perpetrator out there taking children right off the streets. Um, so that's partly why I built the bulk of the story around the second one. Yeah. Um, the, I, I learned something new about my hometown in your book. And I thought, is this artistic license? And I got on Google and it wasn't. Okay. So there's a lot of tunnels underneath. Oh, yes. Des Moines, especially the south side. Yes, that is absolutely true. I, I actually didn't know that myself. I had no idea. I interviewed the, one of the, uh, the original investigator on the Eugene Martin case. I tracked him down and he, we had a couple um, pretty extensive meetings. I interviewed him. And in one of our interviews, he mentioned um, that searching the south side of Des Moines in particular was a logistical nightmare because of all the cisterns and that basically the south side underneath the south side of Des Moines, it's like Swiss cheese because the south side of Des Moines was originally a coal settlement. It was one giant coal mine. Like, it's it all was honeycomb you know, down there, I guess. Yeah, old honeycomb. And um, it was an, named after an old Russian develop or Russian village called Sevastopol. And so once the city, the modern city was built over it, the mine was shut down, it left all these tunnels behind. And there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of cisterns all over the South side of the city that um, in every single neighborhood that would, it would be very easy to drop or dispose of or hide a body in them. Um, and occasionally, even today, um, they collapse like tunnels yeah. just periodically see on the news that someone's front yard has um, imploded and, and collapsed one of these old tunnels. Over the um, last 40 years. Yeah. You know, this, I'm like you, this is not something I think about every day. I'm, and I just turned 50. It's been a long time, but it's just like, it's part of my psyche. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I've always thought, whoever took these boys, you know, where do you hide the bodies, first right. of all? And then when I read that, I thought, Johnny Gosh is, is, has been in one of those tunnels for 40 years, you know, could be, you know, be. Edu mm -hmm. educated guess. Hey, Mike. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you guys pay attention. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was a young woman from Florida that disappeared in the Midwest. Mm. And her boyfriend arrived back here and then, he vanished too, and they, they found his body. Oh, yeah. I, I saw some headlines about that. The, are you talking about the Gabby Pettito? Yeah. Pettito case? Yeah. yeah. So there's, a, there's an interesting little corollary to that is that all across the country, they put together search parties to go look for her body. Everywhere they thought that she might have been, they put together their search party. Every single one of those search parties came up with a body. Yeah, I think they recovered something like six bodies of missing persons, yeah. not oh, oh. in any way related to the Gabby Pettito, Pettito case. No, oh, okay. Or Petito, so, or however you say her last name. Yeah, year. that's you told yeah. me that once before, Pete, and that, that's so mm -hmm. filling. So basically, okay, so, it just tells me that you have to look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so I read this story about Jerusalem, and uh, they found in like some catacombs under the city. A skeleton with a knife in its back and it, the skeleton was like four thousand years old and the chief of police says we don't have many leads <laughs> yeah. probably not you know so it's you know the, 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 the investigation is, is ongoing yeah. there's missing yeah. people all over the world and I'm, I'm sure it's similar well you know our friend laird baron talks about how easy he's from australia and grew up there how easy it is People think it's so mysterious when someone disappears in the wilderness, you know, mm -hmm. place like Alaska in the wild. Mm -hmm. It's easy as hell, you know? Yeah. And, it, and a little bit what Peter said was um, sort of the basic idea of the framework that I was playing with in the book was the mm -hmm. idea of one very high profile case inadvertently exposing another crime. Um, 
uh, accidentally. Yeah. Um, that was the whole premise that I was working off of. Yeah. Have you read um, uh, Sebastian Younger's uh, A Death in Belmont? Um, I don't think I've read that one. No. So back in 1963 in Belmont, where Sebastian Younger grew up as a kid, there was a neighborhood murder. A woman was killed by, and they quickly arrested the uh, African-American man who she had hired to um, clean her, her house. And they accused him of strangling her and they convicted him. And never the, ever brought up again. So Sebastian Younger grows up, he becomes this world-renowned journalist. Mm -hmm. And he goes home and he's helping his parents uh, clean out the house and he's going through photo albums. And he's looking through the photo albums and he sees this picture and there's this guy with the family. And he freaks out and he's like, mom, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And mom says, that's Bert. Who? And he's like, who's Bert? It's like Bert was the, the local handyman back in the 60s. He helped everybody. And he's like, mom, this is Albert DeSalvo, the oh, Boston wow. Strangler. Holy shit. Oh my gosh. So they now think that he killed people elsewhere and just got away with it because he wasn't looked at. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't want to reveal any plot points, but you explore that in the book too, Callie, mm -hmm. how, how, especially back then, and unfortunately, a lot of the time now, the immediate mindset of some people is, okay, the not white person, yes. you know, whatever nationality that might be, the, the right. other, you know, and how sad that is. And um, that's probably all I should say about that, because I don't want to, it's a really good book, and I don't want to spoil it for anyone. In the very, near the very end, in, in your um, author notes, you write something that really hit me too. Uh, it's difficult to quantify how much these cases impacted future generations of parents who were children like me when the boys went missing. Former latchkey kids who grew up in the shadow of these abduct abductions with lost faces staring at us from the backs of milk cartons, grocery sacks, and public bulletin boards. We were the first generation of kids taught to fear every stranger who was just a little too friendly, to avoid every corner that was just a little too dark, and to suspect every passing van that drove just a little too slowly. And because of that, we grew up to be equally paranoid, vigilant parents. And I look at that and I, I see with my son, you know, as he's, he's 19 now, so he can take care of himself, but I was pretty, over uh, pretty overprotective of him, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it's so true and, and that, my wife would have to rein me in sometimes and you know yeah. just let him have his space you know yeah. and she was right you know several years ago a, a good friend of mine she's a writer um who she's Canadian she grew up in um Toronto and moved to Des Moines with her husband when he got a job here and they were raising their young children and one day we were out for lunch and she made a comment to me about how um on the five o'clock news here in central Iowa, if a child reports to, to an adult or to a school or someone that they saw a white van, like driving really slow past the school, it made the five o'clock news. And she was so baffled by this in central Iowa that like if a stranger um, talked to a child on a street corner or even there was a hint of trying to entice a child away, it makes the news here. And not having grown up in the Midwest, she'd never heard of the cases by that point. This was so bizarre to her. And it occurred to me what it must look like to outsiders. Um, but here in the Midwest, up until those cases, I would say Midwesterners and Iowans in particular were a little on the smug side that we not here, you know, that stuff only happens elsewhere, like in big cities, definitely right. not the Midwest We're we're above that. We're not those kind of people. And right. that mindset, that sort of 
attitude. Um, I, and I'm a, I'm a native Iowan. I'm, I'm proud of the Midwest. I'm proud to say I'm a Midwesterner, but sometimes that comes with baggage that comes with mindsets that, um, I think set Iowa up to then take to, to then have that absolutely wrenched away from them by those two cases. And it changed everything. And since then we've had other very high profile, um, missing children, murdered children, some, some pretty awful cases, but up until that point, Iowa really hadn't. And so those two cases changed everything. It's it, it, you can't, you can no longer say, well, not here. Well, really? Yeah, it can happen anywhere. Not, not to say that people should be terrified, you know, just to even stick their heads out their front door, wherever they live, but sure. There's a balance, but still. there's a balance, right? It just, it doesn't have anything to do with geography. It's just human nature. And it's just kind of what we all have to live with at the end of the day. You know, when I was reading the book, I kept thinking of a line from a TV show. Uh, Sometimes uh, evil drives a minivan. Oh, yeah. (laughs) You know. So true. uh, It, it, for those listening, this is a really, really good read. If you like, if you're, if you, if you you have a Kindle, it's only $1.99 right now. Uh, This is November the 14th, 2021, in case you're listening five years from now. Um, it's a really good read. And um, for me personally, you know, all the streets that you mentioned and, and so forth, I was like, wow, I feel like I'm back in Des Moines, you know, and uh, I learned why finally uh, I'm, I, I'm 50 and I finally learned why we go trick or treating on October 30th yes. in Des Moines instead of on Halloween night. Mm-hmm. so <laughs> oh beggars night yep. people who Cold move into the night. midwest are just so perplexed by what the hell is this you don't <laughs> trick-or-treat on halloween no nope, right. no nope, not here in iowa nope we have to do it different we do it the night before it's called beggars night it's a whole thing <laughs> yeah um and when i got to the end of the book the whole book was pretty emotional and at times i had to to set it aside and then come back to it but it's just so bittersweet and i I was just in tears reading the last couple of chapters oh thank you um you know this really happens Mm -hmm. it it happened and you know this is i just i just can't recommend the book enough and uh, I can't say too much about it either without spoiling it. So, um, you guys have any questions for Callie that I haven't asked? I'll take that as a no. So Callie, what's your next project? Yeah. So my next project is another, um, fictionalized crime novel, um, based on a real case, another real case here in Iowa. Um, it was a murder case that took place, um, down in Southern Iowa, where I grew up involving, um, a young wife. She was pregnant with her first child and she was murdered in her sleep. And there was, uh, the, the suspect list was two people. It was either her husband or this mentally ill neighbor who lived next door, um, who had lived next door to the couple for some time. And he had schizophrenia, um, and the town, this, this, the city where this took place, um, really reacted towards the mentally ill neighbor. And that, that case in particular got on my radar around shortly after 2017. Um, because in my town, I live out in the country, but I do have neighbors. We're all on acreages on the same street. And in the spring of 2017, Um, my longtime neighbors who lived across directly across the street from me for 15 years, it was a husband, a wife and their 24 year old daughter. They were murdered one night by their 21 year old son who was, who is schizophrenic, um, and was his mental illness was undertreated at the time. And he had a psychotic, he had a very severe psychotic break 
and he murdered his whole family. And because of where we lived, the proximity of our house, we were kind of um, caught up in the middle of it when it happened in the middle of the night. Um, and so this mental health aspect really got on my radar in a, in a strong way. And then around that same time, I came across the Lisa Teckel murder that also had this mental health element um, with the neighbor. And so I started, that's all it took. I started working on a new book um, loosely based on the Lisa, Lisa Teckel murder. Yeah. The what mental the, health aspect um, yeah. is, so it, it reminds me of um, when we had all these abuse scandals in churches or you know mm -hmm. local elementary schools and things, people have this sort of idea that um, kidnappers, murderers, rapists, and these things, they're all like, you can, if you look at them, you'll recognize them, right? They all look evil, you know, they, they squint and they're ugly and things, mm -hmm. but like in reality, it's, um, if, if it were that easy to identify, no one would ever get kidnapped, right? Right. It's, and that's kind of the issue is, um, I know as someone who's dealing with PTSD, um, the way people responded when I would first tell them, um, this look of like, they would assume I'm like Rambo, that I'm gonna go on a berserker mm -hmm. rampage in a small town at any moment, because people just, they're not informed, they don't know, and they get all their information from the TV, mm -hmm. right? So Law and Order SVU or whatever the case may be, that's how they understand, at least in my experience, that's how a lot of people just understand this stuff. It's so true. And you know, it, even though the case with my neighbor across the street ended in violence, that's actually, once again, I'm back to a statistic that's sort of misunderstood and overblown that, um, you know, mentally ill people generally aren't um, violent and that, that the opposite happens, that they become quite vulnerable in, in their communities. Um, and it, that's what happened in the case of this Lisa Teckel murder, the, the neighbor um, was suspected um, because of his mental illness. And he, they had had some property disputes. Well, it, it ended up being far more complicated than him just being mentally ill. And I, I remember pulling some old newspaper articles and some news footage um, around the time and neighbors, other people in the town interviewed, referred to him as crazy, unstable. He was dangerous. You know, he had lived peacefully, peacefully there for many years. Um, and I, I was struck by sort of how vulnerable he was just simply because he was mentally ill, that he could then be targeted for, for other things. Right. Once yeah. again, uh, going back to suspecting the quote unquote other, mm -hmm. whether that other is mentally ill in some way or um, they're a minority, mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. Um, I, I think the last thing I want to say about the monsters we make uh, is that they're, 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 Two, there's a conversation in the book with two kids and one says to the other, I'm being real vague here. Um, why didn't you tell, you know, the responsible adult mm -hmm. that this was happening? And they replied, I did. They didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that just hit me right where I lived. Yeah. So it, it's, yeah. Uh, it's a very good book. Um, you know, and I, and I think, I, I don't know, but you're probably attracting a lot of fans of true crime, I would imagine, reading the book, too. So, yes, thank you. you know. So um, you teach, what did you say, creative writing? Yeah, yep. So I'm, a, I'm on faculty in the Lindenwood um, University MFA program. So I work with all graduate students getting their MFA in creative writing. Yeah. And... When do you anticipate your next book coming out? I just finished, um, I finished the first draft this fall. I'm right now, I'm just finishing up doing some revisions um, to get it turned in by the end of the year. All right. And in the meantime, The Monsters We Make has a film option. So oh, you're then kidding. I have to That's pivot. Great. Yeah, now I have to pivot. Um, it's the producer is, who's interested in it is looking at a limited series. So um, 
I'm going to, I've been working on the pilot episode, which is you totally know what? <laughs> that, that's exciting. And I think, you know, we're in a new golden age of television and that would tell the story better. Yeah. You know, a, a limited series yep. than a movie. Yeah. So I just hope if it does happen that they actually film it in Des Moines, that would be, that would be great. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for being here today. Is there anything that I didn't think to ask you that you want to add? No, that was great. Thank you. Okay. Well, the monsters we make, it's available in print, Kindle, and I think Audible as well, right? Correct. Yep. It's on audio. So, mm -hmm. And uh, very inexpensive right now on Kindle. So yeah, pick it up. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you enjoyed Richard Chismar's uh, The Boogeyman, you would enjoy this. So yeah. So um, I'm not saying they're exactly alike, but they're in the same ballpark. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so anyway thanks for being here Callie I really Thank appreciate you so it. much and uh, I hope we get to talk to you soon and I hope the uh, series comes through yeah thank you yeah. so thanks enjoy the rest of your Sunday night thank you have a good one so now I think we oh there's Bridget I was about to say we lost Bridget uh, now we're going to talk to David Conyers David why don't you introduce yourself um, hi, um, yeah, David Conyers is my name. I'm from Australia. Uh, I've been writing Lovecraftian science fiction for since the mid two thousands. Um, my day job: I work in the construction industry. I write tenders, uh, so for major construction projects. Uh, I started out as an engineer, so I spent a lot of time working in the outback on construction projects. Um, and I've traveled, well, I think it's 25 countries now across the world. So that was a big influence on a lot of my books. Um, and I suppose this year I released my Harrison Peel series, which is basically about an Australian army intelligence officer who gets involved in the mythos. And, uh, and then his subsequent kind of adventures and um, explorations of the uh, Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos across three books. I originally released it um, in the book that Matt showed before, The Spiralling Worm Through Chaosium. Um, yeah. Um, and that, it kind of came out of um, a couple of short stories that I published, one was in an anthology called Horrors Beyond that came that was edited by William Jones. And uh, once that came out, there's a story in it called False Containment, which was basically about a like an outer god uh, that could travel across time and space and could exist outside dimensions uh, that humans could perceive. And once that came out, a lot of authors and editors started approaching me and saying, hey, this is a really interesting character. Um, and a really interesting setting, writes more. So it kind of grew organically. And, um, yeah, so for across the 2000s and the early 2010s, I wrote a lot of story, and, this, and then I got kind of burnt out and changed genres and started writing espionage thriller fiction under another name, and that's going reasonably well. But then I always never felt like I finished off the Peel series. Yeah. So I came back... Uh, yeah, this year and basically wrote a few more stories, edited the whole lot, put some better continuity between them and released the three books. So Cthulhu Reloaded, Cthulhu Resurgent and Cthulhu Remorseless. And well, uh, you, you've done a lot, you've done some work with Pete Rollick. He's holding up Cthulhu yeah. Re Reloaded right now. So uh, I actually just, I got to make a comment. If, yes. if you're new to David Conyers, uh, what blew me away the first time I read it was the story Impossible Object. <laughs> it is a really wonderful, creepy Lovecraftian story that doesn't involve anything except a reference to Yith. And yet it just works so well. I mean, that just, if you read that, you start with Impossible Object, you'll just get sucked in. Well, uh, uh, the only thing where I can we find actually, that, Matt? That's in uh, Cthulhu Reloaded. Okay. okay. Um, I, I would say the only, 
I've been trying to think what have I read that's similar, and the only thing that sort of comes close is Mind Bridge by Joe Haldeman uh, yeah. about this this thing. It's it supposedly helps you read minds, and it seems so simple. And the explanation is, it looks simple because it's like the shadow of a book, and you only see the shadow. Uh, that the actual reality of the object that you're trying to perceive is much different. It's just creepy and good. I just wanted to say uh, thanks for writing that story because that was great. <laughs> thanks. Actually, that was the first Peel story I ever wrote. That's great. Yeah. Hey. yeah. You want to oh. interview this this fine writer here? <laughs> so I spent like hours going through all my books and pulling stuff together and I had like all this stuff laid out and all these questions to ask you. And in your introduction, you answered all the questions. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so from this point on, I'm winging it. <laughs> That's okay. Look, hey, you, um, you usually wing it pretty well, Pete. One thing I was going to say was um, one approach I took with the whole Harrison Pills series was, was, the science fiction approach because I'm, I'm more of a science fiction reader and writer uh, uh, and you know mike was asking me yesterday what, what horror novels films so forth do i like and I, I was going through a list i mean you know it's all science fiction and i think that was uh one of the approaches i took with um the peel novels like my favorite lovecraft stories are at the mountains of madness that's my top and then the whisper in darkness and the shadow of time which are basically all about alien entities um, rather than, you know, witches and cults and things like that. And that's kind of more of the approach I've taken. Uh, and, yeah, so I've kind of, it, it's kind of like a science fiction series in the mythos setting. And, I've, and I'm also very interested in cosmology, astronomy, physics, things like that. So I've picked up a lot of that. So a lot of the gods, my interpretation of them, like, Azathoth is like a collapsed wave function of probability in the quantum world. And uh, Ashogoth is like a 10 dimensional super stream um, being. And, and uh, Cthulhu is like a naked singularity with the event horizon of a black hole that's gone missing. Yeah, that kind of thing. That was one of the approaches I took. And that was one of the other things that seemed to appeal to people when they were reading it. Um, and the other approach yeah, I love I think... that. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, just, I just said I love that. Thanks. Yeah. And the feedback I get from readers is they go, you know, the way you describe these, these gods, it's almost like it could be real. <laughs> you know, I go, well, it's not real, but you know, I try and marry it with this, the, the, the fringes of what science is exploring at the moment, just to give it that, that science, science twist. Right. Right. And you do that really, really well. Um, and that amongst other things, particularly, that is what really has drawn me to your work. Thank um, you. One of the things that I really enjoyed is seeing you work in, say, non-Western mythology and, and imagery. Yeah, um, <laughs> you say that. Uh, I, whether it's Australian, I think there's some African work in there as well. Yeah, well, I, I backpacked through Africa in the 90s and I spent a lot of time in places like Kenya and Zimbabwe and Zambia and places like that. And that was like my first big overseas trip. And that was a real eye-opener for me and one of the best travel experiences I ever had. And I, I suppose I just, from there, I had an interest in that. Um, and, you know, as a kid, I was always a fan of things like Indiana Jones and James Bond, you know, and they have real let's go to these exotic locations. And I think I just, I was drawn to writing about that. And I, and I feel like a lot of Lovecraftian fiction, and I guess it's the nature of the authors who write it, it's, it's either set in Europe or, or um, the United yeah. States or Canada and so forth. And, you know, that, to me, because I'm on the other side of the world, I'm mean, living in a Western country, but, you know, there's enough people writing in that location and they can do it better than I can. And I just thought, you know, there's this whole world out there to explore. Um, you know, I used to write for the uh, Call of Cthulhu role-playing game and one of the books I released was The Secrets of Kenya. So that got me a lot of, you know, based on first-hand experience, but a lot of research. So I think somehow I managed to learn a lot about Africa um, 
And that helped me build the background to be able to write in that setting. So is that what you mean? Is that the, the, the African yeah. setting? Yeah. I do. I, and I do like that. I love being able to see a different take on the mythos and how it plays out in different cultures. Thanks. So there's that. And then the other thing I like is like, like you've said, the completely different setting. Um, a couple of years ago, I was asked to edit a, um, a collection of uh, Australian and, and New Zealand um, mythos stories, not edit, but do the introduction for. And I was surprised at, at the quality of writing that's coming out of there and just the, the, because the only other person I knew besides you was um, a, a very um, old sci-fi writer whose name escapes me at the time. Who? Um, um, go ahead, you know it. Is it Val Mort Mortensen or something? It's Molesworth. Molesworth, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's the Blinded They Fly, I think, is the, yes. the mythos story, right? Yeah. And uh, like I had spent years trying to get my hands on that story and I, I you find that story is in the card edited by Shane yep. Jeremiah Cummings and right and Angela Chalice yeah that's and I'm in that one as well yeah so did, it, go ahead uh, uh, you go ahead no no Mike go ahead I, I was just going to say to David and to Pete and maybe Matt has a take on this too uh someone listening out there who's not read any David Conyers at all where should they start Cthulhu Reloaded. I mean, I basically put the whole series together. It's chronological. It follows the character of Harrison Peel through, I think it's like 20 plus stories. They're all connected. Um, they're definitely my most popular. They're, they're, but people, you know, it's, it's something about the Peel character, I think, appeal, appeals, appeal appeals to people. Um, and one of the feedbacks I got about him was, you know, you've got characters like Titus Crow and Anton Zarnak they have these magical powers and deities helping them. But one of the th feedback I get from readers is they like how Peel is basically on his own. He's just a human. I was just going to say that, you know, yeah. he's just, he's very competent at what he does, but he is, uh, he could be hurt. He could bleed, you know, yeah. he's got people he cares about. It's, it's like, he's really a person. He's, he's like Batman with all the, you know, super powered, superheroes around him they've all got special abilities but he doesn't you know he's just he's just relying on his wits and um skills yeah and training so yeah, I, yeah everything he, comes back to batman of course <laughs> <laughs> and he correct me if i'm wrong but you're drawing a lot from your engineering background for a lot of his stuff um yeah it is a bit like like i said i, I you know i, I spent Back in the 90s, I spent a lot of time working in the outback. When I say the outback, I'm in like, you know, Mad Max type country, like the middle of nowhere. So I've got a lot of experience working in places like that. Uh, you know, an engineering degree is, you know, one step removed from a science degree. So, you, you know, I've done a lot of mathematics and okay. that enables me to understand, you know, I read a lot of science books and I read, watch a lot of science YouTube shows and, you know, I'm always looking at the, you know, what's happening in cosmology and quantum physics. So that, that always helps. Uh, yeah. And I, and I think it's just also that, you know, I've, I've done a lot of travel. I've lived all over Australia. I've, you know, I've been to the U S a few times of, you know, Asia, Europe, South America. So all those experiences I've drawn upon as well. Uh, adjacent to Pete's question, uh, just amateur but my entire life, um, I've been interested in astronomy, cosmology. Yeah. Um, t t tell me a little bit how you draw from that. Well, uh, so. And, I and, you... and I always love hearing what fascinates somebody else who's, you know, uh, loves astronomy as much as I do. So, Well, I think one of the things I loved about astronomy is, you know, when you look at the stars and you realize that you know just how far away they are and you know like it one of the analogies i worked out one day was if you got in a car and you drove you know at 100 kilometers per hour which is i don't know what's that 60 70 miles per hour it'd take you the rest of your life to drive to the sun 
you know, right. that's just how far away it is, you know. And if you want to drive to Neptune, you know, way out there, you're talking thousands of years of that speed, you know. And so when you start thinking about how big the universe is, it's just massive. And and when you look at what we're trying to work out at the moment, you know, we, we understand fundamental pit, we understand fundamental particles like the atoms and what the atoms are made up of and we understand relativity and gravity but you know we haven't been able to marry quantum mechanics with relativistic space you know and that's where right. black holes are so fascinating for for science at the moment because that's where quantum and relativity come together and that's where you've got this thing this this singularity where um they don't understand the science. So nobody really knows what goes on inside a black hole, but then does all these really weird things. Like if you fall into a black hole, uh, you know, your information is spread on both the surface of the black hole and then disappears in the black hole. But the, by the time you reach the singularity, the rest of the universe is aged an infinite amount of time, you know, and then there's all these kind of weird things. And to me, that's kind of like, that's Lovecraft, you know, this is all this yeah. really weird. Um, yeah. Like, like I've often thought and said, um, probably not as well as you could say it or Pete, but uh, yeah. Is there, is Cthulhu out there somewhere in the universe or Azathoth? Well, hell no, it's fiction, but yeah. you know, if there are races out there, intelligent races, I mean, it, it's a very, very, very slim chance that they're anywhere near where we are technology wise. Yeah. They could be a million years ahead of us to us they would be gods you yeah know, with everything that they can do um i think my fascination with astronomy david started uh i was one of those nerd kids who read encyclopedias so i, I got i got i was reading about pluto and they had an artist can uh uh draw a painting of of what the sun would look like from pluto and, you know you have all this this icy surface and everything and then below it, it said basically that all these stars in the sky and the sun is just just the star that's just slightly brighter than the rest. And, you know, from that distance and to think that yet that small star, the gra gravity is still exerting its influence on it. The Pluto is going around the sun. So and, and, and that's what hooked me right from the beginning. And then we got dark matter and dark energy. You know, that was my that was my gateway drug right there. Yeah, you know, yeah, most so, of it's made up of stuff we don't know. Sorry. No, no, you you brought up dark energy and dark matter. So I just released a book, the Miskatonic University Spiritualism Club, and I go into the, all the link, concepts. Link in the show notes, people. Is, is um, you know, the idea to your books that, too, David. <laughs> that ghosts and the my go might be yeah. just dark matter. You know, um, yeah. still yeah, like viable ideas like that. Yeah, yeah. There might be. Oh. Um, I had read a couple years ago that when you do the numbers, there might be more dark matter in the universe than regular matter. Oh, well, there is. You know, like yeah. regular matter right. is only four percent. Right. Know? And 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 most of it's dark energy, which is pulling everything apart. So that right. you know, space is expanding apart. At a certain distance, faster than the speed of light. You know that's why we have a an event horizon or a you know an observable universe. We can only see so far back in time. So, but then you think about it. You know the universe is thirteen point eight billion years old, but the mm -hmm. distance to the edge of the universe is like forty five billion light years away. So you know space is expect. It's just every time yeah. you look at it and go into another layer, it's just this bizarre it's thing. And I just I just always wanted to try and match it up because i feel like a lot of lovecraftian fiction and there's a lot of great stuff out there it all comes from the horror fantasy side of things right and and i feel like this this whole sci-fi side of it is just there, there could be more done with it i think you know i absolutely agree with that because there's this sense of awe mm. that is mm. missing the horror is there and it's maybe it's very well written in a lot of cases it is but this mm. sense of awe uh, the depths of not only space but deep time for example yeah yeah, um, yeah. so and that's mike that's some of the stuff that we touched on in um the peasley papers yeah exactly the one story deals with the heat death of the universe um, um i should also mention that 
the Harrison Peel series is actually connected to Pete Rulick's um, Jack Terrible Old Man series. There's a, there's a crossover <laughs> yeah. story. Yeah, we did that. We secretly did that. I what? Think, yeah. All right. Um, been nice talking to you. <laughs> No, yeah, there's a there's a um I have a minor character who is like what is he a cousin, a nephew, something like he's, that? He's the uncle of Harrison Peel. Uh, okay, he, yeah. He appears in one of my stories and he appears in one of yours. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And uh yeah, he's just um we I I don't think a lot of people picked up on that, but the oh. right people did. Yeah, and in um in my collection of short, unconnected um, horror stories, Cthulhu Unmasked, I've actually got an overview of what I call the Code 89. It's kind of like a Delta Green or a Jack or so forth. But okay. it, I actually mentioned your Jack organisation in there and how the two are linked. So I've got a bit of an essay on that too. Oh, Just nice. Some nice. continuity. Um, Everything's in my stack to read. Yeah. Oh god, yeah. David, I know you you got the same problem. Your two B red pile is just too big right now. Oh look, it, it, one of the problems is I'm writing two genres now. So, you know, I, I'm I'm probably reading far less than even you are. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the other other thing that um you know, science fiction, Lovecraftian fiction, um what what's the earth four four point three billion years old about a third of the age of the universe something like yes, that yes yes yeah four point four yeah yeah and in all that time humans have been around you know if, if you do the 24 hour clock Six analogy seconds. we've been around a few seconds yeah and modern humans even less than that yeah you know but somehow we feel like the earth was made for us it was just fine before we got here and it'll be just fine after we leave yeah. You know? Well, you know, if, even when you look at the Earth, you know, they reckon in about 600 million years it's going to be too hot for life because the sun will have um, got bigger. And, you know, so even though the Earth's got, you know, middle age, life's not going to last that long. And if you well, go we're, back... We're helping speed it along, though. We're doing our part with the heat. Oh, look, we, we, <laughs> we, could, we could do some great stuff to uh, make, you know, human habitability very uncomfortable and, you know, potentially even terminal, but... I think life will find a way through. Yeah. I read um, something the other day about how much oxygen this really got caught my eye is on the moon in yeah. rocks and so forth. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, Rick, you, you had a question. Yes. Since three of us are here, Pete, David and me, we all did a round robin together. Yes, we did. Well, yes, we did. Called the Eldridge force. And so we write a sequel. <laughs> You should. I thought you all hate me because I killed all your characters. <laughs> no. Well, luckily I did I, I utilized a, a character from some from multiple writers, so you didn't kill off my character. And I was well, you know what I'd really like I'd like to do? I'd like to do something like a, a, a Marvel universe with with um with all our characters, you know, like They've all got their own stories, but it'd be great to bring them together in a, in a novel or a collection and go, you know, here they are, they're all teaming up and they're going to team up and they all bring their own skills and, you know, something like that. I so I re recently I re DC did, um, sorry, Pete, go on. I recently did something like that in the book of Yig. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm, actually, I'm working on one of those with those guys now. So. Yep. DC Comics recently did something. Uh, it was the very start of death metal where they get into these, uh, this into deep time and these gods that are, you know, as old as the universe or created this universe and so forth. And then there was another one, a very good one off four parter called Cosmic Odyssey back around 1988 or so. I don't know if you read that, Pete. Jim Starlin. Yes, and yep. basically, Darkseid calls some heroes from Earth. You know, Darkseid being the ultimate bad guy in the DC universe, uh, or at least right up there. He's run into something that makes him look very, very small. And I thought there was something quite Lovecraftian about that when I read it. So, so not to you know. 
Jim Starlin probably is responsible for, I would say, 25% of what we're seeing on Marvel Cinematic Universe. From really? Thanos. Yeah, I, I think even... Oh, well, this, did, did Rick told us before we started that the latest Marvel movie is Lovecraftian. Yes. Shang, what is it? Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi. But Shang-Chi. yes. Okay. But, you know, the whole Thanos and Infinity Stones... Um, Certain people have shown up in the in the Eternals movie. All these things go back to Jim Starlin. Um, but we're we're getting out of the out of talking to David. To going uh, this is what we do, Pete. This is what <laughs> I, do. I know, but I want to focus on David because you know he's he's giving us his early morning hours on a Monday morning. So. Um, David, I know that uh, our other uh, Rich wanted to ask you, uh, he stepped out for a minute, but he wanted to ask you about your military background because he seemed, he feels that you've got it right. Um, so my answer there is, no, I've never served in any military capacity. Um, however, I do work in an industry that does a lot of defense contracting. Okay. I think it's hilarious well, that you asked this while Rich has stepped away. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, but but one of the things is I've, you know, it's it's research. So, and the internet's fantastic for that. So it's always, you know, like um, if I'm going to use a gun and, and this uh, comes out of the, like the, the thriller writing that I do as well, you know, pe- people who read that genre, they don't want to know it's a gun. They want to know it's, you know, it's a Glock 9mm 22 with, you know, I can't remember how many bullets in the chamber, you know, and they want to know that information. They want to know that detail. So I've done a lot of research on that. And often it's just, you know, well, how how does a Glock work? You know, I I don't fire guns. I'm, despite what I write, you know, I'm, you know, pacifist in that sense. So, you know, I don't believe in gun ownership for individuals and, you know, uh, sure, as a military, yes, and that kind of thing, law enforcement. Well, you should move to Texas. Yeah. (laughs) It's a lot of fun here. Wow, that um, but but what I was saying, but so what's your, you know, you watch your YouTube Hey, there's Rich Bunting. First of all, I get accused of not sending him the link. I hope you noted, noticed how wrong you were there, sir. <laughs> I did. I'm having lots of computer issues right now. That's why I got up. And Pete asked your effort. question while you were gone, by the way. Oh, he did. Okay. So, well, um, oh, I can see my books there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say, like, just if I want to find out about something, I watch a YouTube channel. You know, there's there's enough people out there. Says this is how a Glock works. This is how you can pull it apart. This is, you know, how you slide out the chamber and you get the the bullets in there. And you know, and you know, I, I remember making the um, terrible mistake early on about mentioning that a Glock has a safety and it doesn't. You know, it's just and 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 little mistakes like that made me realize, you know, I've got to get that that attention to detail. That's, so it. That's it. That's yeah, it. We we can't have that. If if you if you mess that up, we can't be reading your books. Yeah, but for some people, that's very important. <laughs> it's a joke. It's, it's it, it really is. And if I'm going to write military Lovecraftian science fiction, you know that's what I do. That's why. Yeah. I, you know, I, I read as much Lovecraft as I can. I try and read modern authors because you know, if you're not reading who's writing currently, I, I feel like you you're just behind the eight ball all the time. Um, you know, and I, I read science fiction, I read science, and I'm checking. It's just, I guess it's just the part of the process of being an author, you know, you, you, you check, you research. Um, there was a quote by Lee Childs who writes the Jack Reacher novels. He said, you know, I never research a book, but I'm always researching. Right. So you're always, you know, you're always reading or watching something or learning, you know, in your downtime, if I'm not thinking about a book, I'm, I'm researching something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I go back to the travel. The travel was some of the best experiences I've had in terms of my writing. It's allowed me to, to get this kind of understanding of how the world works, you know, the good or bad. And you know, I think that's what my trip to Africa kind of went, oh, wow, this is, this is how the other half lives, you know. You know, if we think we've got it bad in America or Australia, you, you go to Africa back in the 90s. I was there when the... Sudan war was going on, the Rwandan genocide was going on, 
the Congo wars were were happening, famine in Sudan. I said that, and you know, I was, you know, David, that's that kind of thing really gives you perspective that a lot yeah. of people don't have. Um, and you can certainly gain that perspective without traveling, but it's harder. Um, yeah. But you know, you, <laughs> you when you see something like that, then you think, well, actually, I don't have anything to compl- complain about, you know. Yeah, and I, I met people that come out of these war zones while I was there. You know, you just I remember one guy had this hole in his cheek, and it was basically oh, where the bullet had um had um you know, been shot. Just a random bullet went through his cheek, so he had this hole. And you know, you think about how lucky he is. You know, he could have. That's um, yeah. So I guess, and it just it just gave me a whole different perspective, and I think that's influenced me in my writing. So uh, you, yeah. You s- Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, just uh, you know, I, n- I never really planned to write the Harrison Peel series, but something about it came together. I think it was the mixture of the science, the the human character, and my overseas travel experience, and in and a character that you know in Lovecraft, everyone kind of faints at the side of anything. You know, no one actually really tries to fight back. And I think that was Lovecraft's own personality coming through. And a lot of authors have gone, well, everyone in the Lovecraft story has to react that way. But I don't believe that. I believe, you know, some no. people will try and fight back, even though they're faced with overwhelming odds and they know that the ultimate battle is lost. They'll, they'll still try. And I think that's one of the appeals that people have liked about the character that, you know, despite the awful things I put him through, he keeps going. And uh, it, it reminds me of a, a TV series I mentioned here before that I love very much. My wife's in the other room. So she's about to roll her eyes. Uh, Angel uh, spin off, spin off of Buffy. Shut up, Pete. Oh, the, but his, <laughs> but you know, at, in the very last episode, Pete, what what is his theme? It's that we're going to lose, but we should fight anyway because it's the right yeah. thing to do. Yes. Yes. You know. So. All right, so David, one last question. Yep. Um, no, I've got a question too. All right, go ahead. <laughs> you can ask yours first. All right, I'll ask my first. So, you've got the three Harrison Peel books come out. You've got this other Cthulhu. What is it? Dossier. Uh, oh, it's Cthulhu on Mars. is a collection of basically all my unconnected short stories that I've published over the years. But a lot of them tie back to the Peel series. So, for example, I created a mythos tome called The Masked Messenger, which is basically, it's kind of like an Arabian Nights version of a mythos tome. And it, it kind of focuses on the mythos in Africa and the Middle East and a bit into the dreamlands and stuff. So that appears in a lot of my stories, but it also appears in Peel's series. And then some of the incidental characters who appear in the Peel series also appear in this collection. So it's kind of like a spin-off, but just incidentally collected short stories i also have a collection of my science fiction short stories called nanofabrica um that's more kind of straight sci-fi cyberpunk type fiction okay uh and then i've got a collection of my other horror coming out early next year called uh, the nightmare dimension i had an original draft of that but i've gone through and re-edited everything because you know when you go back and look at your work after some time you realize you know, it's not as good as you <laughs> should remember. So I did a lot of editing. So basically this last year I've gone through, you know, I've got all this material, let's put it together and let's bring it out. But what surprised me was I put out Cthulhu Reloaded, Cthulhu Resurgent, Cthulhu Remorseless, which is what I planned to be was a complete Harrison Peel series. That's why I called it that. But it's just got sold so well. It's just gone off the charts in Amazon and it's just keeps selling and selling and the numbers keep going up and I've just got people. Contacting That's really me. great. David. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm thinking I need to write more in the series. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask is like, if you were like, you, there are a lot of authors who dabble in the mythos at first, then they go off, find their own voice and do something else. And I thought maybe this was your way of just like, I'm done. You know, now I can go with head held high to my other projects, but it sounds like, You've been, you try to get out, they suck you back in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, was, I was blown away, to be honest. You know, I get on there and there's reviews and they're saying, you know, fantastic, you know, loved it, great that David Conyers is back, you know, finally can get all these books together. And it's just, you know, it's getting good reviews, it's getting good sales. And I just thought, well, I've got to keep it going. 
But I don't know which of you have read to the end of the third book, but it kind of goes really weird, like really weird. <laughs> <laughs> that means something coming from you, David. Yeah. That... Um, now, if for those, if I well, should just, say. Just quickly, so, yeah. that, so what I'm thinking is it's kind of almost going into a Cthulhu cyberpunk type setting. That so that sounds great, actually. That's yeah. where I think the next books will, and I'll probably do more novel as opposed to short stories. But uh, anyway, look, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure where uh, I've got plans. I, I plan to do more. It's just, you know, like I said, the 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 feedback I've got's been fantastic, and I'm really grateful for all the fans out there and everyone who's supported me of reviews and uh, recommendations, and you guys for getting me on board. So, yeah, uh, for, so, uh, for anybody listening that is sort of overwhelmed with, I mean, you've written a lot, David, a lot of good stuff. Um, I just want to say in the show notes that I've got a link next to David's name, and that leads straight to his Amazon page. Uh, the U.S. one, but, you know, you can go to yeah. whatever country you're in, you can go to that. And um, so, you know, you can go in there and browse, start with Cthulhu Reloaded, if, or if you already read it, look at all his other stuff. So uh, I also wanted to ask you, uh, David, you, you, you were talking about reading a lot of Lovecraftian fiction and staying on top of the latest Lovecraftian fiction. What are, are do you have some favorites? Um, yeah, I thought about that. And I suppose there's so much out there now. It's hard to, yeah. you know, get across everyone. But I, I think about some of the authors I've worked with and some of the editors I've worked with, um, like Peter's, Fiction is fantastic. Um, Brian M. Salmons, who I've worked with, I think he's one of the best editors of Cthulhu anthologies out there. Um, I really like working with William Jones of um, Dark Wisdom, is it Dark Wisdom Press. Anyway, he was, I, I don't know what happened to him, but he, he did some great stuff. Um, I've been reading some Lab Baron recently, and he's great. Um, Caitlin uh, Kernan, The Agents of Dreamland, I thought that was a fantastic novella. <laughs> Uh, Cody Goodfellow. Uh, oh, that guy. Yeah. If I can comment, William Jones got very ill uh, yeah. just as Elder Signs Press was really coming to the fore. And uh, then uh, I don't know how well he recovered, but he had these various health problems. And then he and his wife broke up. So right. that kind of like completely did in Elder Signs Press. And I've not heard hide in her hair since. No, I haven't either. And uh, yeah, but thank you for telling me. That. I did. I didn't know what happened. You know, being in Australia, you're just so far removed from everything. Less so now these days, but you know, back then it was. Yeah. Yeah. Any, um, any others? Uh, yeah, Cody. Uh, Cody is great. Absolutely yeah. great. The other one there. I really like is Peter Klein's. Oh uh, yeah. Like well, you better years. like him. He blurbed your book. He did, and you know what the interesting thing was? Um, he wrote this book called the. Robinson Crusoe Lycanthro early on. Yeah. He came to me and asked for a blurb. <laughs> I went, okay. That's nice. We had him but, on a couple and, of years ago. Really nice guy. I love yeah. uh, his novella 14 very much. Yeah, that, that's like one of my favorite books. You know, just the way he wrote that, it's just the characters are brilliant and the way he structures the story is brilliant and the Lovecrafting cosmic horror elements are brilliant. Um, okay, yeah. then, he, then he wrote a book related called what is it the fold the fold yeah that one's fantastic but, too but then he was going to write a third one and he was only going to release it's like audible or something so really? i don't know if that ever yeah there was a third book I involving think, i don't know if it ever made it to print yeah i think it's out there i can't remember the name of it i um but there's he's, he's written a few more i think in the series there's one set on the moon or something um i must admit i'm behind on my petty clients reading um yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, Jeffrey Thomas, really like his work. And I think he's one that's, you know, good on the sci fi elements of the mythos. I couldn't agree more. I have, I have no idea why Jeff is not uh, hugely famous and has a Punk Town series on Hulu or yeah. something like that, you know, because that would work out. That would be great. There's yeah, so many good. stories to tell, you know. Punk yeah. Town is amazing. Yeah, I'm just trying. That was That's one. Right. Those, those I, I I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um. Yeah. One of my favorite short stories is "A Cold War" by Charles Stross. I thought that was just 
just yeah. so different, but so very Lovecraftian. Um, right. You nailed it yeah. right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, uh, again, uh, anyone who wants to delve into David's work, you've got a lot to, you got a lot to read. This is great. <laughs> and um, uh, David, we're going to talk about some more, how should we put this nerd, nerd stuff, Pete. And yeah, you're welcome to stay that. unless you need to get going. I really uh, appreciate I'll you being here today. Yeah. You, you want to hang around? All right. Yeah, I can pipe in. Well, well thank you for the interview, interview before we continue. No, thank you yeah. very much. It's been fun. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I've got to meet some of you that I've only known through email. For yeah, I long think long. we've only we've only done things through email. And, you know, yeah. I remember when you announced that you were going to stop doing Mythos stuff. And I was like, okay. And then all of a sudden <laughs> you're back. And I'm like, well, that was it's a good thing. I had this five years where I just went, I can't do it. I burned out. I really, you know, it's just, it yep. just, I was just, and look, the I was trying to break into some, uh, look, I don't know, something changed in the sci-fi community and I just wasn't having any success. And I think maybe it wasn't writing what the market wanted or something. And uh, So I just went, you know what, I, I'm over it. I'm just, I'm going to try something else. So I started writing, you know, um, like James Bond type thrillers and that's, that's having its own success and kind of building in the background. But yeah, but I just, I just, I felt like I just need to come back to Peel and finish it because it just, it wasn't everything else I released before felt really rough. And that's why I wanted to get that, the three books and really tight and concise and internally logically consistent, which I also hadn't done. So yeah, oh. so I kind of look at Reloaded resurgent and remorseless is you know that that's the that's the official peel series now awesome well this is a little little late but uh, this thing is heavy look at this thing um a a lovecraft retrospective centipede press and thank you to seth bradley who sent this to me matt you have one of these too don't you it's incredible it's a wonderful book it's it is absolutely like lovecraftian art that is the book to have in your collection. I, I can't believe Seth sent this to me. I really appreciate it if you're listening, Seth. So uh, I wanted to mention that. Um, let's see here. Do you want me to go on my rant? Yeah, why don't you go on your rant and then I've got some stuff. All right. Yeah. Good. Shake. So- make sure you shake your fist at the clouds when you do it. But... I actually this, agree. I, I agree with everything you're about to say. So, this may be an old man shaking his fist at the clouds. However, <laughs> yesterday I came across a call for submissions for an IP, an intellectual property that I would love to write for. That I would I have been a fan of since I was knee high to a grasshopper. And that is Kolchak the Night Stalker. Mm-hmm. However, I am likely not going to write a story for Kolchak the Night Stalker or Preach. even try to submit. <laughs> the offering for this is for any submission from 1,500 to 7,500 words is a flat $50. And they're doing a Kickstarter for it. So you and could raise more money to pay better so, rates. So Pete, wait, before you go on, what is pro rate now? Is it six cents or eight cents a word or what is it? I think it's eight cents a word at this point. But it's not, you know what? I would, I'm not even worried about eight cents a word. My concern here is that at best, even if you turn in the lowest word count, that's three cents a word. And if, if you turn in the highest word count, that's like a quarter cent a word. Well, you and that's I talked word. about this and how much you would love to. I would love to, to do this, this. But you're but worth a lot more than $50 a story. I'm worth a lot more than $50 a story. And here's the thing. It, it's made kind of clear in the posting that, you know, you'll net, you don't, you won't own the story because it's a it's a intellectual property that's already registered to somebody else. 
So in other that, words, you can never put this in a collection three years from now or whatnot. Right. One of your collections. So it's a it's a one shot payment of fifty bucks. You'll never be able to reprint the story. You'll never be able to sell it again. And the but the publisher will be able to publish it ad infinitum. And keep making money off of your work. Right. And we're not trying to, Pete and I aren't trying to piss anybody off, but uh, we do see it as our job on this show to protect writers, right? Well, I can see, yes, that I do, you know, that's not been a big part of our job, but it is, we have called. Well, we've done it before. from time to time, might yeah. be more accurate. And, and if it comes up, we do it. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but I think this is kind of abusive. You know, Eve, you know, and it, the publisher is a big publisher. It's Moonstone. You know, they've had they've been doing um, stuff like this for years. You know, Kolchak stuff. I've got a whole bunch they, of Kolchak. Yep. Yeah, they had me write for Kolchak. Yeah, I know. I, I just, I just don't think this is is a, a fair offer to writers. I don't know what quality writers you're going to get for that price. I guess my, my biggest question here, besides what you've said, is if you're going to do a Kickstarter, why not ask for the amount of money that you'll need to pay your writers better than this? Exactly. Yeah. You know? And if you can't do that, then don't do it at all. Right. You know, this all goes back to the, the whole Harlan Ellison rant. Pay the writer. Mm -hmm. You know, Fifty dollars for a you're ask you're offering fifty bucks for a seventy five hundred word story, that's not enough. That's not that's nowhere near enough. But unfortunately, a lot of people who who are coming into the field who just want to get their name out there, and particularly are going to say, "Oh, I want to write a Kolchak story," will will write it, and not realize that they're kind of doing themselves a disservice. This is. In my mind, this is one step above exposure. And people die from exposure. <laughs> That's well, a great way to put it. <laughs> it's not even really getting your name out there that much. I mean, okay, you got a you got one story in a cold check. That, that's not the reason to do this. No. No. Oh, and so anyway, that's my opinion. Your mileage may vary, but I'm looking at this going, you know. This, these open calls don't come along that often. And that's a, that's a low price. And I don't, I don't think it's right. So. No. I totally agree. So. All right. So that's my rant. All right. Crazy old man, you know, putting that hat aside. Uh, pseudopod. Uh, pseudopod. Yes. We love pseudopod. We and did? they just did a um, Laird Barron story. So I just wanted to make our audience aware of that. Uh, it's called American Remake of a Japanese Ghost Story. Um, yes. Uh, now that I've said that, mention I've got the link to, to Michael Shea's book in the show notes as well. So Matt, why don't you show it and talk about it? Okay. So if you think about like one thing that Lovecraft did was there's people talk about Lovecraft country where there's a physical topography where his stories took place and other authors have run with that. Uh, for example, Willem Pugmire had the Susquehanna Valley and Ramsey Campbell had the Severn Valley. Well, Michael Shea, uh, unfortunately deceased a few years ago, his mythos was the San Francisco mythos. He lived there uh, working at a min at a uh, cheap hotel at the front desk for many years in the early 1980s. Just near, he was like close to the Castro district. He was on Mission Street just before AIDS had kicked in. And the gritty underbelly of San Francisco is something he knew from living it. And a, a lot of his best stories like Fat Face are set in San Francisco and the city becomes part of the story. Well, we didn't know, but he had written a novel in like 1981, 1983 called Mr. Carney Harm. And it is um, 
set in the same area of San Francisco. It is basically a long riff on The Hound. Uh, S.T. Joshi edited it. Uh, Darren, uh, Derek Hussey published it for Hippocampus. You can get the limited edition hardcover, but they also have a cheaper soft cover version. Uh, I've started I'm like five chapters in. I'm really, it's like such a pleasure for me to read a Shea story set when he was writing at the height of his powers that I've never seen before. You know, um, it makes me think of an episode I did a, uh, maybe a month and a half ago, two months ago with, it was just me and Cody, Philip Fricasi and Laird Barron. Uh, if you want to look it up, folks, it's, I titled it a buddy horror episode. Uh, whether you want to watch it on YouTube or, you know, listen on Spotify or whatever you want to do. But the reason why I bring it up, Matt, is because Laird talks about me meeting Michael Shea. And when he went to San Francisco, he could immediately feel what Shea was writing about. He says it a lot better than that, of course, but it's, it's really, it's a really interesting. What, one of my favorite city trips I took with Isabel is we went to San Francisco and we stayed at the Marine Memorial hotel. Cause I'm, I have a membership because I was in the service and we walked all around. We went through the Castro district. We saw vertigo at the Castro and we walked those streets. And it's another reason maybe that I'm so fond of Shay's fiction, but yeah. it's, it's something that we've always wished for, but never thought we could get, which is more Michael Shay original prose. I read um, that face recently. Yeah. That's a great story. That one. Oh Yeah. It's, it's one of my, it's like makes my top mythos stories list. You know what that reminds me of though is Brian McNaughton used to clerk as at a hotel at night. Oh my God. He, he was like, it's a no tell motel and he was third shift. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when he would write his good porn stuff. Right. All right. Here's another public service announcement. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, Pity the Reader on Writing with Style, is $1.99 on Kindle right now. So if you are a writer or do you want to be a writer, this is like the deal of the month. So I wanted to wanted to point that out. Um Okay, so yes. last last week you told us that you were thinking about watching the wind. I did watch the wind. So did I. Are we in agreement? Uh, uh, it's one step above the yellow wallpaper. So you're about to break wind, as it were. It had such potential. It did. It really had a lot of potential, but it didn't live up to it. Yeah. That's the best I can say without spoilers. Is it w worth watching once? Yes, but I would never I don't watch know. it again. Yeah, I'll never watch it again. I, I really had high hopes for it. Yeah. Uh, and I really did because I was thinking of, uh, uh, what is it? The last winter. Sure. You know, I was thinking it would be like, like the weird version of little house on the prairie. <laughs> and it, it had such potential. It really um, did. And, or, you know, or the burrowers were the burrowers. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, it it just didn't pan out. So it kept it kept us guessing too long as to whether it was real or fake. Uh, yeah. And you then guys, did, you guys aren't convincing me to give it even one try. No, I wouldn't. Yeah, I do. I wouldn't. Anyway, so there there. So I have a question: Has anybody watched a couple of movies that I just uh, Matt? made me aware of a, of a movie called The Old Ways that looks pretty good. And The Dark Tapes, which is found footage, which I usually I'm pretty sick of, but it's 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, those are two of the choices for Easy Movie Night next week. Oh, right. I put them on there because I haven't seen them yet. Okay. I don't know if Bridget's seen them. She's a movie fiend. What about The Green Knight? I actually haven't seen those. I've seen dark tapes. Yeah, I, yeah. Is I it enjoyed, good? I enjoyed dark tapes. 
but I, but I'm a sucker for found footage anyway. So my threshold for awesomeness is much lower than the rest of you, you know, more uh, <laughs> discerning folks. Oh man. Uh, let's see. All right. So I've got a movies page that is at the website that I'm proud of, but it's a little behind. It doesn't have like the last couple of years movies. And anyone out there with a suggestion, feel free to email me. Matt, you have some suggestions. Um, I've got color out of space out on there. What are you talking about? Uh, I didn't know you had the Stanley. Uh... Oh, no, I don't have that one on there. Haven't seen it. These are just the movies that we've watched at Easy Movie Night over the years. They're, they, I, I sent them to you if I thought they were in the realm of they, they're Lovecraftian because okay, there's things we that. watch that, that, we, that are completely unlovecraftian. And then the next thing is, are they good? So these are movies that I liked. There are others that we've seen that have been dreck, like HPL's The Deep Ones. You can watch a girl well, with her boobies running down the beach. That's the highlight. That's like, come on. Well, um, you've got The Empty Man on here. That's I'm definitely putting that on there. Um, the, empty the, vast, man, huh? the Empty Man is the Lovecraftian version of Angel Heart. Yep. There okay. you go. Uh, the Vast of Night. God, I love that movie. But my question is, is that Lovecraftian? I think there's some Lovecraftian elements. You well, know, that one... gets to be a, a matter of, is it? I don't know. Well, they completely didn't understand what was going on. Not only it, that, but... There, was, there, were, there were weird languages, uh, potential time travel. And then in the end, you, what, what do you think happened to the, the protagonists? Is there, they, there's a, there's they, a scene take... where the lady says to, where the shut-in lady says to them, free will isn't possible with them that's the best scene in the whole movie yeah they did that weird language so well when they walk in there and she's speaking that language so to me they that really was did a good job it was really before they ever said it was really really uncomfortable to listen to i was thinking the exact same thing the th he did such a good job with the veil of night so that's why I kind of put it on my list as you could think of that in a Lovecraftian way. Well, you got some sort of entity up there that's controlling people, taking people, and we don't understand it. Yeah. Alien languages. What do you think, Pete? Um, I would put it on there because I think there is some influence. And besides, it's a really good movie. Yeah. And I enjoy when I get emails from people saying, what the hell is this doing on the list? So I'll do it just for that too. That's you know, another reason. I, I you know, <laughs> I, I got a copy of Lovecraft in the, the Lurker in the Lobby, the, the Lovecraft film book. Yeah. And there's a bunch of things in there that I go like, really? Okay. It's a stretch, but yeah, I, it, this might be a stretch, but I think it's still worth putting in there. All right. So what is the wailing? Is this Lovecraftian? No. Okay. It's a good ghost story, right? It's a good ghost story, but that's well, well, it's a good it's a good ghost story, which I still don't understand after watching three times. So, but that I, I from what I understand, that's the point. Okay, here's a non Lovecraftian movie you've got on here that is really really good, The Wretched. Well, is it? I mean, think of these as. Uh, are they kind of like Keziah Mason? Uh, they're insatiable. They can remove your child from your memory. You never really get to see what they look like, and they have this real creepy, spidery lair. Did you say That's memory or mammary? Memory. Okay. I I heard mammary. Hey, hey, I'm not I'm not subtle enough to like put in something like that. I would have used a different word. It, it was uh, it, it was a Rorschach audio Rorschach test for you, Pete. But but it's like if 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 you, my thought was like okay, the entities themselves, the way that they uh, can manipulate your memory, and uh, that that's kind of why I did it, and the fact that like oh no, you can't really defeat them. That's you got a point. Yeah, but my hat covers it. 
uh, Block Actually, Island I really Sound. Did, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Enjoy Bridget's recommendation, Terrified or Aterando. Um, I that was um, something that I was really. It's one of those gems you just don't realize is out there. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, that movie scared the crap out of me, and it definitely has it me too. <laughs> some some Lovecraftian influence there. I think. Well, well Bridget. And Rich, can I ask you guys this? Because I I watched the first fifteen minutes, and then it sort of got, I felt bogged down into them explaining things to each other. You know what I mean? It there there is kind of a lull, but it moves after that. I think. Okay, I'll I'll it keep does. watching. And there's even though there's lots of talk that you think there's, you think it's like Ghostbusters trying to explain everything. It really doesn't pan out that way. Okay. It's just them trying to figure out amongst themselves, really. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, they're trying to figure out what happened and how they should react to it, but it's not necessarily what's actually happening. Right. Uh, Matt, you mentioned The Shrine. I do have that on the list. That's a really good movie. Oh, okay. Uh, Dead Wax. Uh... Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. Dead Wax is definitely. Definitely. It's a, it's, it's not, it's not a movie. It's a, a limited series of like eight episodes and the episodes are only like 15 minutes each. Yeah. So it's the same length as a feature film, but it's actually a series. Is it Lovecraftian? Oh, hell yes. Mm-hmm. I think you've Is watched this, like, I think I watched the first episode. It's on shutter. Uh, yeah. It's worth okay. it. Uh, is this, is this one of those like uh Jim of files um, experimental film that in yes. that area? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, I love that. Yep. Yeah. All right. Sold. Mm-hmm. And and Flickr and what Ancient Images by Ramsey Campbell. Cigarette Burns. Yeah, Cigarette Burns, which I wish I can't find anywhere anymore. That's the Masters of Horror one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully, I own it on DVD. Of course you do. Because Hi, Dave. It, are you saying in? Did they make Bye, David. Thank you for being Thanks. here. Thanks very much for having a good me. Day. Really appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Did they, did they make a movie version of uh, Ancient Images? Oh, I think it's a different. It's not I don't know. Mm-hmm. But Dead Wax is cool because it's about sound. It's about a record. Yes. Yeah. It, it's not similar, but it was uh, sim- for similar reasons. I like Barbarian Sound Studio. Yeah. Which I also thought was kind of Lovecraftian. Creepy movie. Definitely for a fan of Italian horror movies. I watched that movie at um, um, the Griffin's house at one convention when Joe and I were staying there. And Joe had already seen it. He fell asleep halfway through because it was really late at night. So, but that's that's... But so, he later he later rewatched it and said it was great. Yeah, yeah, he liked it. Um, apparently, um, they're just taking everything from us. Apparently, uh, Jerry Seinfeld's apartment isn't really <laughs> possible. And Hot apparently, off the press. yeah, uh, apparently these people have not heard of non Euclidean geometry. So, yeah, or or read dreams in the witch house, because that could explain a lot. His kitchen juts out into the hallway. Uh, okay, this is like those guys from Galaxy Quest. It's like I know it's not real. Oh, I knew it was real. Yes, Come on. exactly. <laughs> I told you we were talking. We were going to be talking about nerd stuff. You didn't believe me. It just uh, puts it makes Seinfeld like a completely different watch now, though. If you think about that, you're like, oh right. wow, they walk through a portal to another dimension because his apartment's in another dimension because it could possibly be in the same dimension as that hallway. <laughs> and therefore, <laughs> Seinfeld is Lovecraftian. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> uh, I believe Rick wanted to talk about Doctor Who and Batman: The Long Halloween. Yeah. Um, Doctor Who is plummeting in ratings. I know, but the um, new six-part miniseries, the second part was very well done. The first part is a setup. It's it's, it's, going to be a six-part series which brings in 
virtually every major alien race from Doctor Who. So it's epic in scope, and the first part is hard to judge until we get to the last part. The new overarching villain, though, is very good so far. He's okay. called Swarm. He, he, he looks great. He's got a sister named Azur, who also looks great. So, so far, it's off to a good start. They did the Sotarans much, they got away from the comic relief of the last two doctors. They finally got the Sotarans back at villains with some good humor worked in. They invade the Crimean War because they want to ride on horses. That was a good joke. And uh, I'm just saying, so far, it's a good start. All right. Um, Long Halloween. I loved it until Batman discovered who the murderer was based on how he treats the murderer. You've seen the movie adaptation, you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, the, the comic was much, much better. <clears throat> it uh, reminds you... me of, uh, I was just going to say, Hush, the Hush adaptation had a similar problem. Yeah. Um, where they kind of changed let me put it this way. If you've only read the comic and you think, well, I already know the story, I don't need to watch this, both Hush and Long Halloween are not quite the same as the comic book, and, and they change the ending pretty drastically. They didn't have a problem with who the murderer was. They just had a problem with what Batman's decision was. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess Russell T. Davis is taking over again next yes. season. Doctor Who. Yeah. Is Jody Whittaker leaving? Yes. Okay. Well, at least there's going to be another season. So that's that's good. Uh, we got anything else to talk about? Oh yeah. Well, I wanted to add one more show movie to your um to your list. Okay. Uh, I caught this a few months ago, and I didn't think anything of it. Uh, it's a um, Spanish language film, m- movie uh, originally called La Influencia. Um, it's translated as the influence, which is its original title by Ramsey Campbell. Oh, you're kidding. And it takes a more Lovecraftian take on this story than I think Campbell's original novel. And, um, I think it owes a debt to Grandma by Stephen King. Okay. Which I is also Lovecraft. I just wrote so, it down. So, yeah. I think it's a really a nice little thriller um, that I really enjoyed that I think is overlooked. Um, on a completely different note, the Russian movie called The Widow, which is about remote rescuers going into a forest to save a kid who's lost is just a Russian version of Blair Witch Project. Oh. And okay. not we're very well done, so don't bother. Let me ask about another couple of movies I've got on my list. Uh, not for Lovecraftian, but just whether I should watch them or not and see if you guys have seen them. Um, Stillborn. It's a 2017 film looks pretty I, good it sounds like something i would watch but i don't remember it uh night at the eagle inn is a 2021 movie haven't seen that one yet <laughs> wow 100 percent on rotten tomatoes and 3.9 out of 10 on imdb well that's a big spread that is <laughs> makes you think uh i think that's all i got yeah yeah, okay. well, yeah. I wanna, uh, did you ever see the Victor Frankenstein movie from 2015 with James McElroy? I think so. What do you think about it? Let me uh, let me see if I can remember. Well, I it, it seemed to me to be an attempt to do a modern Hammer t- style. Movie. Yes, yeah, I yes, I remember that. I did like that. I thought they I, did a really good job with that. I liked it. I thought they did a good job. If there's a fault in it, it's the fault that's in all Hammer movies about Frankenstein. Right. The scientist is more interesting than the monster. Yes. I mean, before they reveal the monster, it was just, it wasn't 
that it was inadequate, it just it wasn't superb. Correct. No, I think that was a really good take on the whole thing. Uh, I think they did a really good job. Yeah, so if you're a fan of old time, Peter Cushing, Hammer Horror movies, watch Victor Frankenstein with James McAvoy. Yeah. Um, one thing I'd like to say is, uh, or like about midway through December, just remember that uh, as originally announced, tickets for Necronomicon 2022 are supposed to go on sale in December. Mm. So just uh, keep your eye out. Now there's, they sell like 1200 tickets or they used to, I don't know what it's going to be. No one ever really has a problem getting a general pass, but if you want one of the higher end passes, you kind of have to do that on the first day. And you may also want to look into setting your hotel reservation now. Uh, you get one of those higher end passes, you get to meet people like Pete and Matt. That's why people pay more. <laughs> they don't get to meet me. I hide in my room. Uh, that's not true. I stalked Matt the whole last Necronomicon and Pete. Well, that's just because we were, no, we, we were both stalking Victor Laval. That we weren't. I may have accidentally run into Victor like five times. I only did, I did like two or three times. Yeah. <laughs> we're not, not that we're shameless fanboys. Also, Pete's uh, hotel room, um, everyone should ask to see it because he brings an entire library with him when he goes to Necronomicon. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Uh, there's just like books stacked on all the tables. The couch is covered in books. I don't know how he got them there. It's very strange. You're not stacking them on the other bed, are you? Because you promised me a place to sleep. He has a suitcase of holding. Yes. <laughs> uh, we are terrible nerds. Okay. And it, remember that there is a prize. If you want this illustrated Call of Cthulhu, uh, send an email to easyandprizes at gmail.com and put COC in the subject heading. Uh, we'll probably end up choosing a winner after Christmas, giving people plenty of time to enter. And now... A word from our sponsor. I do have a Patreon. Speaking of Victor Laval, he's a Patreon, so he's really cool. So why don't you be really cool and be a Patreon? Uh, actually, there's a lot of cool things you get uh, by being a Patreon. Um, one of which, at the $10 and up level, uh, this is just one of the things I throw out there at random, but this is one of my favorite stories so i wanted to mention it uh the night ocean and i commissioned john paget to read it uh the night ocean by hp lovecraft and rh barlow and uh it's, it's just a brilliant brilliant story and john it goes without saying does a wonderful job with the reading so it's, it's much more barlow than lovecraft yeah yeah to give absolutely. credit to give credit where credit's due Careful about saying that to Mike Rick. He may go off on you on a Facebook comment. Oh, for God's sake. I never went off on you. I will never forget this. I've posted screenshots. Uh, your wife has already dressed you down over it. Um, I just, 10 years from now, I'll remind you, Mike. Don't worry. Um, well, I'm crossing you off the, the Christmas card list now, Ben, so. But you know, I, just okay. ask, I want to ask a question of the group. Okay. Since James Bond got mentioned several times during the uh, interview with David Connors, how many of many people besides me and Ben saw the latest movie? No Time to Die. I didn't know there was one. He's taking his head. Does that mean I know I, it's I, out there. I just... I, I, I want to watch it. We're going to watch it around Thanksgiving when Isabel okay. and I can just sit down together. All right, we can later get into a debate over it when everybody watches it. I know Ben That's and I are on it. Ben and I are okay. on it. All the uh, sides. It's, of it's literally and, the only time I've ever disagreed with Rick. Ever. And do you know why Matt's going to watch this with his wife? Does anybody know why after she, all these years? Because she told me to. That, yes, that goes without saying. But because she you she will not watch scary movies with you and you are too afraid to watch scary movies by yourself yeah what's well, the yeah i watch hallmark movies that's pretty scary <laughs> i just assumed matt was a huge billy eilish fan and wanted to be able to enjoy the opening theme with her 
So or uh, maybe it, Daniel it, it, Craig it, has something to do with it. it. No, no. It, yeah. Well, no, she doesn't look at Daniel Craig. What are you talking about, Bridget? No, He's stop dreamy. it. Dreamy. It's like she likes the action and the script. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of like, why does she watch The Witcher? Oh, I don't know. Probably the cool story, I think. So <laughs> not the eight packs. I have gone back to the movie theater maybe Apex. four it's, times. It's, it's the, the different. Life. It's like the you have to. <laughs> That's you have the to, fantasy six pack. It's an eight pack. Right, right. Now you can get it, but you're like, he's actually one of the few people in the world who does the right workout. To, never mind. Superman, what do <laughs> you expect? I was like, yes, Pete. We're, we're waiting for him to become Captain Britney. Yeah, we are actually. He wants to do it. Henry Cavill, we're talking about. Yeah, Pete, you, do you have right. a comment? Yeah, so I've been back to the movie theater four times in the last six months. I am... Uh, Done? I'm not happy. You know, I think things have gotten worse. Hey, I think, folks, another uh, old man rant coming up. This is another old man <laughs> rant. Like, I think that movie theaters are on the verge of going out of business. And if they do not get the cell phones, the talking, and the running in out of the film under control. I I'm, actually agree with all this. I'm not going back. You, I, I'd rather just watch the movie at home. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I, I'd, rather, I'd rather stay home and pay the extra money. Extra than, money? It costs more to go to the theater. Yeah. Absolutely. Only if you, you buy a popcorn. Well, no. Well, no, if you go to the theater with two of your friends each one of them have to get a ticket if your two friends watch a movie with you at home you just pay for the movie once right yeah and, and then and your you friend, own it then your friends stiff you and you're just resentful the rest of your life well, maybe maybe that happens well, it depends on how, how <laughs> when if you buy it when it's on dvd it's sometimes you I yeah mean, but you, i i saw the bond movie on amazon prime for uh, okay for 20 bucks I just, oh, I just that, that cost you know, my son got to see it too, so that's the price. My just my latest my latest for... my latest DVD is Monolith Monsters. I can't wait to watch it again. I, I, I watched seen that, that for, the other day. I can't. I've not watched it for like forty years or something. Sure I watched uh, it the other day. It was so that, good. That's the Pete. guy from Incredible Shrinking Man. Yes, right? Williams is that his name? Yes. Can you do me a favor, Pete? Pete, when you finish up this this rant on movie theaters, just kind of do that for the viewers yeah. <laughs> i tell you what i went to um fye yesterday with my kids and i bought a movie happy death day i love I that thought, movie i, I haven't it's, seen it but i've heard it it's actually oh, it's good. amazing <laughs> it's it's great it's groundhog day yes with a serial killer and it's a murder mystery oh that's great daniela watched that with me she loves groundhog day and it's scary, but it's also really funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are looking for a Christmas show for movie night. We don't have a sequel to Santa Jaws. So. Yeah, great segue. I was just going to mention, now This you there's a lot of links, uh, various links in the show notes, okay? Uh, for example, you, the link to listen on Spotify, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Pete's a new book, that kind of thing. Our guest books. Uh, but I also have a link to the kind of community of, community events that we do pretty regularly now at Lovecraft Easy. And obviously, we do this, what we're doing right now, every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, okay? And then Matt does, uh, well, let's, let's go in order. Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, I've been doing horror old-time radio. And um, the people were really liking that. Um, Scott Thomas actually told me this. This really touched me. No, no kidding. He said he likes to listen with candles going in his office. And he emailed me and said that it's added something special to his life. So, Mike, did you just say Scott Thomas touched you? Touched my heart right here. <laughs> right here. Okay. Get your mind out of the gutter, Rollick. I just hearing things. So, so you're hearing mammaries. You're hearing touching. I, I, yeah, I know. Pete, <laughs> I got to call Mandy. So anyway, that's that's on YouTube Tuesday nights, old time radio. Go to YouTube, type in Lovecraft Easing, um, and you'll you'll get to it. It's it's a playlist. 
Um, Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern time. This is kind of Patreon night. We either do uh, a podcast that only the Patreons can can watch with a guest or alternating Thursday nights. We just do a Zoom chat with the panelists and the patrons, and we all just talk about whatever. It's not recorded, not broadcast. It's a lot of fun. And then last but not least, 9.30 p.m. Eastern time, Saturday nights, Matthew Carpenter uh, rolls out the carpet for movie night. It's a lot of fun. So I've got a link to all of this stuff uh, in the show notes. All you got to do is click on the forum. It'll take you to the easing page that goes through all of this. So, all right, let's see who we got next week. Um, who we got next week is, all right, up and coming writer, uh, Josh Mallerman. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Maybe you should read a book of his sometime. Yeah. Or a movie. Be prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Next week, uh, Josh Mellerman. And um, then the week after that, Catrion Ward. Um, okay. The Last House on Needless Street. Have you read that yet? That's mm-hmm. a really cool book. Yeah. So, anyway, guys, thanks for being here. It was really good to see all you guys. So, and everybody, thanks for listening. Uh, special thanks to all the Patreons. And we will. Uh, either see you at one of the events this week or we'll see you next Sunday. Thanks a lot. Good night.